yeah take your own opinion on that but exactly oh well right how are we doing all right well welcome everyone we might as well uh, get into it so my name is scott Lee. i'm one of the organizers at morning startup and and welcome to another morning startup over zoom thank you to to covid uh, i'm also joined here with dave newman and our presenter today, as you're surely aware, is uh, Tom Smolarek, who's going to talk to us all about uh, Google search. So before we get into that, though, we've just got a couple of things that we want to go through. Uh, the first of all is introductions and shameless plugs. So feel free to use the chat section in Zoom and... Put a link to whatever you're working on. Just make sure uh, you switch the switch the little widget instead of going to panelists, go panelists and attendees, so everyone in the Zoom can uh, can see what you're working on. And I don't know, Dave. Do you want to? If if anyone actually wants to do a face to face shameless plug, I know you can sort of promote people to a panelist temporarily. Do you want to do that? And people think, can actually. Yeah. Share I what think if anyone's on. brave enough, we should give at least give them the chance to, to have that shameless plug. The only problem we had last time was we can promote them to the panelists, but we can't get rid of them. So, ah, okay. okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, no, we can do that at any, the end. Yes, exactly. So if we if we got any shameless plugs or anything you want to introduce yourself, um, by all means, put your um, details here in the, in the chat window and we will read it out. But um, needless to say, we'll be back in person, hopefully, fingers crossed, all being well in two weeks' time. So you can, if, you, if you want to come along and meet us in person, we'll be at RIF, 45 St George's Terrace, at the beautiful time of 7.30 in the morning, and you can share your shameless plug and intro then. Yep, it's always better in person. If you can make a morning startup, get there, and then we have networking after the talk, and yeah, that's the my favourite part of Morning Startup is just getting to know everyone that's that's uh, doing something cool in the in the startup industry in Perth. Exactly. All right, very good. So, um, shameless plugs. Don't have anything in the chat right now. Uh, just people saying hello. Hey, Yuri. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, chuck a link in there, and uh, we can always do a shout out uh, through this uh, little intro section. Um, we won't interrupt Tom's talk with shameless plugs, but we can always hit that at the end. Uh, okay, so ammo marketing. Um, I've got a hat here. I should have. Oh, Dave, good job presenting, representing. So uh, if you can, please head to ammo.marketing. These guys have been awesome and, and helping us uh, for the past year actually pay all the, the funds that it costs to, to run this meetup group, especially over Zoom. Um, and if you can, head to the Weird Growth Podcast as well. They do a and I, they're probably once a month, I think, is the, the frequency where they have a really, really good interview with a, with a Perth-based founder or startup personality. So make sure you're subscribed to that and check out their marketing services. They are awesome, awesome blokes. And I just want to say, I just feel so bad because I've just seen this logo and Cam called me this week, or it may even have been last week, and I was right in a meeting and I said, Cam, I'll call you back. Cam, I will call you back. I'm just a little bit slow in that <laughs> so i will call you back today in fact once this this podcast once this is done i will give you a ring my friends uh, apologies to make it official ammo marketing check them out that's right happening on dave time all right dave you want to do beach him beach him yeah so to to beach him are great supporters of morning startup basically they've been with us from the start uh, boutique recruitment uh, agency here in uh, WA. Um, if you are looking for that uh, new role or you are looking to bring on new staff, um, or if you're wondering what's going on in the marketplace, as so many of us in, in startup world are, as to what's happening with the market and why is it so difficult to find the right resource? So why is it such a hot market at the moment? And how can I overcome that? Um, then go and give Glenn and the crew a, um, a call at the Beecham Group. Um, if you didn't check out last um, morning startup, I believe we did record that one. I can't. Did we record it or did we not? Uh, Glenn's no, we didn't record that one. Unfortunately, it. it was such great content. We should have recorded it. But if you're not, uh, I'm sure if you uh, hit up Glenn at the at uh, Beach and Group, then he'll explain to you how you can stand out from the team in such a hot market. And you know, as we all know, that uh, there is. Um, 
you are going to pay top dollar at the moment for a, a, a developer or a business analyst or, or something in that scene. Um, but how can you, as a startup that has limited funds, um, get ahead of the, the bigger players in town and make yourself stand out to the right candidate? So, yeah, check out Beecham Group. Great, great guys and girls there. And um, we love them. And uh, thanks for supporting us for all these years. Absolutely. And finally, uh, AWS. So AWS are very kindly supporting Morning Startup um, through their Activate Founders Fund. So if you like, you can get $1,000 in credits and $350 in developer support. Uh, just head to that bit.ly link on the screen right now. And that tells AWS that uh, you were at a Morning Startup and you, you heard about them and you're going to get your 1,000 credits thanks to us. So that would be very, very nice. And if you are watching AWS, because I know you do watch some of these, um, we have seen your email and we will reply to you very shortly. <laughs> in, in Dave time. <laughs> cool. And of course, there's a bunch of other supportive organizations in Perth that you should get around. Um, the first, obviously, is Space Cube. So we are usually there at Riff at 45 St. George's Terrace doing this. And if you need somewhere to work, it's a great place to do it. In addition to their, their new one called Fern and uh, Flux, which is all down St. George's Terrace or St. Brody Terrace, as we like to call it. Yes. Um, plus eight. So plus eight is WA's very own uh, accelerator. There are two parts with it. The plus eight, the main accelerator, and then there's plus eight sprint, I believe it's called. Um, definitely worth checking it out. Um, plus eight have just closed, or just at the Friday of our last one, closed the applications for this year's cohort. Um, actually, if you have applied to it, I'd love to know who's applied. Put yourself, it will ping us individually or or put a message in the in the in the chat there. We'd love to know who's applied, but uh, Great to see some new, great up and coming companies coming through that accelerator. Um, and um, yeah, they've been a supporter ever since Plus Aid started of Morning Startup. Um, if you haven't subscribed to Startup News, then check out Startup News. It comes out every Friday. Um, go out to startupnews.com.au and put your name down. And every Friday, you'll get this great little email in your inbox that's explaining what's going on in the WA startup scene. Um, I love seeing it every Friday because there's just stuff in there. You just never know that, that, that what's going on. And there's some great companies that are really kind of kicking some goals. Mm, it's fantastic. And if you want to get your story out there, also hit up Startup News and they'll send a journalist out to you and um, yeah, get your own little startup story uh, out into the world. And likewise with TechBoard, uh, head to techboard.com.au, claim your company's profile and you can make announcements and uh, do a bunch of stuff on TechBoard and that will go out to their investor heavy focused audience. And Voltage Espresso. So usually we're there at Riff and you can grab a Voltage Espresso at a nice price um, by telling them you're at Morning Startup. So if you happen to be in the city this week, please go and grab yourself a Voltage Espresso. I'm not sure if they're doing the Morning Startup discount because it's usually when we're hosting a Morning Startup there and on a Wednesday. Um, but buy a coffee anyway. Go and support them. They're having a... Well, actually, I don't know if they were meant to be open would, over the weekend anyway. But hey, they would have been closed. Yeah, yeah. So. they'll be having a rough week this week, that's for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, go, go and get a coffee at Voltage. So hit that button, Mr. Glue. Are there any announcements? So if you know of an announcement, then by all means, put the message in the box. Um, I can see it's filling up there. Great to see some of the people, um, some brand. We'll go through those at the end. Um, and if there's any announcements that you want to, that we may not be covering, then by all means, put them in the chat and we will let people know. It's probably worth knowing that for those of you who were going to attend this weekend's um, uh, startup weekends uh, it's got a big postponed uh, piece on the side now so I think I would just um, keep referring back to the website Humani Humanitics and uh, check out if it's when it's going to run next but I believe because of the lockdown and because of the limitation of 20 people and that it doesn't officially come off I believe until midnight Friday um, even though it's the weekend I think they've chosen to postpone this so if you haven't heard of um, Startup Weekend Check it out. It's an amazing weekend where you kind of take an idea, meet some really cool people, and you'll take this idea from um, zero to hero in the final of the weekend, and you'll validate that 
um, and hopefully make some sales. Who knows? It's just a great way to kind of get a real in-depth, quick learning of how a startup will work and run. Absolutely. Uh, cool. So Kai is saying they've postponed it and we'll get a rescheduled date to us by May 2nd. Thanks for that. Cool. And Josephine says, try Rubus. All right. Why not? Click on the link and try Rubus. Oh, sorry. Richard says that. Oh, I get so confused. <laughs> How do you use technology? I don't know. All right. <laughs> Anyway, uh, you can contact us uh, via all of these things. Um, we've got a Slack group and everything. Uh, that's how cool we are. So, yeah, uh, if you want to do a presentation one day, we'd love to hear from you. Just hit us up at contact at morningstarter.com and uh, we, can, we can have a chat about it. Uh, or if you'd like to, you know, just get out into the startup industry and you need to connect with someone, shoot us an email and then we'll see how we can help. You know, we're always keen to try and help in any way that we can. Cool. And there's also another Slack group called perstartup.com.au that is just Perth founders having a bit of a chinwag. So get on that and Six have a chat. Perth founders having a chinwag. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. And a bunch of lurkers. I'm sure they're there. <laughs> we love you, really. All right. But uh, that's probably it from us, unless there's any other shameless plugs that we need to shout out in the chat. No. So we'll get into it. So today we have um, Tom Smolarek, obviously, he's going to talk to us about uh, igniting your startup's acquisition engine with Google search. Um, I know personally, we rely on Google daily to send people to our website and get people using our software. And I want to know how to do that more effectively, because you can spend a ton with, with AdWords and um, yeah, do you still need to worry about organic search given that you can advertise? I mean, there's a whole science to this stuff. So let's hear from an expert. Tom, <laughs> over to you, mate. Thank you. I'm going to pause my screen share. You should have your option to share your screen. Yep. Just while he's doing that, I always remember Tom, who obviously had the office opposite ours originally when we were at Flux. And I tell you what, he had the biggest monitors on two brackets. That's why I remember that. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> they were like 255, not like it felt like 255 inch monitors. How these poor brackets kept them up, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I copped a lot of flack from yeah, everyone in the room right. about that. <laughs> they're currently, I've lost them and they've been split out and then our developer monitors, they've got them vertically. So, um, wow. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'll, just, I'll just start out and say um, thanks for the opportunity to uh, present, uh, Dave and Scott. Um, I kind of remember, um, yeah, exactly as Dave was saying, um, uh, going through the startup ecosystem about two, two and a half years ago, um, attending my first uh, morning startup. So it's, uh, it's cool to come full circle and get the opportunity to present about something I'm passionate about. Um, okay, it's good to have you. Yeah. Um, you guys can see my, my uh, I'm screen sharing at the moment, not, not my actual, um, not my actual video feed. Yep, no, we can see the uh, the morning startup background thing. Uh, At this great. point, I could, we could mess with you and say we're seeing pictures of David Hasselhoff naked holding puppies. But... <laughs> <laughs> Just slide sliding three different pictures. Yeah. Bam, wrong screen, yeah. So, all right. Anyway, well, um, thanks for everyone everyone for attending. Um, I'll get into it. Um, I'll start out with just a. Uh, let me just start out a little bit about me. Um, uh, Curtin Lim and I um, kind of went through traditional digital mark, um, marketing initially. I was actually at Channel 9 when they had their 50th anniversary. So that was a pretty cool event. I got a nice little photo. Um, event, then went and started working in digital, um, primarily as a search manager um, across a number of different roles. Um, uh, to today where search is a, a bit of a smaller role within my day to day, um, but um, yeah, still very hands-on in that area. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I'd, uh, I guess I'd approach this from a couple of directions. Um, first, I'm sure there's a lot of startups that want to kind of get some inside knowledge into 
what an expert would, would perceive of how they should should be using Google search, but then also we get some insight into how big companies are running that. So um, there's some crossover, but then there's definitely some different directions in that. So um, I wanted to touch on the big company end very early on and kind of then kind of delve into um, holistically different areas of search from an overview perspective. Um, and then end up talking about some of the more um, startup related concepts at the end. Um, <clears throat> so just a couple of different search um, campaigns that I've worked on across my career. Um, some stories to tell maybe if you catch me for a coffee. Um, <clears throat> but let's get into it. Um, so I thought I'd start out, um, as mentioned, just talking about, well, broadly about acquisition. Um, and search's role in it. So, um, so acquisition is is usually so when we look at the the graph on the right, um, and you're looking at what is really the growth model, um, you're seeing acquisition awareness at the top. That's traditionally where marketers play. Um, you've got your activation, the retention, and revenue and referral kind of working in the product layers and sales. Um, Awareness and acquisition is really about being able to acquire customers or build awareness in front of customers that you just didn't have before. Um, and ideally, those customers have some intent to be able to, um, to want to be able to use you as a solutions provider to their problem, really. Um, so just kind of focusing in on that acquisition layer, um, I guess the way I'll structure this is kind of zoom out and then kind of um, from this bird's eye perspective of acquisition come into um, search and its role. Um, acquisition is really a, a, a really great foundation layer for companies to look at initially, um, just because um, customers have that really high level of intent within the acquisition layer. Usually if we're looking at it from a customer perspective, you are in that phase where you're either comparing solution providers or you're looking for, you're in that buy phase, you're looking for that solution provider right now. So it's great to be able to build some kind of exposure in front of those customers to say, hey, I can be a really great value proposition um, for the problems that you have. Um, and search is a great way to be able to do that. Um, other kind of strategies you see within the acquisition layer, um, but not exclusively uh, around SEO, um, social media within some contexts and content marketing. But um, the majority of social and content marketing are mainly within the, the awareness layer. But that's not to say that there isn't um, what you'd call lead generation campaigns occurring through the acquisition layer. Um, it's the lowest layer of the marketing funnel. Um, and it's, it's also very important, I think, um, within this layer to be able to measure um, how you're actually advertising. So you're looking at concepts like CPA, cost per acquisition or cost per lead, um, which is always recommended um, to be able to attribute and then really understand where your advertising spend is going. Um, I wanted to kind of, when I was initially putting this together before I kind of cut it down, I wanted to talk very briefly um, from the big company perspective around performance marketing, because typically what you see in big agencies or um, in big companies is search plays a role within the performance marketing team. Um, and the performing performance marketing team has a number of different objectives across um, across acquisition. So it might not just be cost per acquisition, it might be might be cost per milieu or CPM. So you're kind of looking at um, more, more impression-based objectives or cost per leads, um, or you could be looking at your costs per sale. Um, but this, I guess what we're gonna cut out here is kind of that top level overview of some of those other um, channels there that kind of support search and, and work side by side, such as nat native advertising, sponsored um, affiliate marketing, social media marketing, and broadly search engine marketing. Um, but it's important, I think, to have that kind of overview, um, just because these are the kind of the channels that big companies are generally brand branching out into. And what they're actually doing and the, what these teams are doing is looking at all of these um, pay performance channels as in you're actually paying for the performance. Um, you don't have that visibility without paying for it. 
um, they're looking at this broadly and they're looking at it from an inventory perspective. So search is um, inventory within the Google index. You know, if you search a query, then you get your four ads at the top typically and three at the bottom. But then there's also different types of in inventory all throughout the web, even within um, Google's ecosystem. So display, um, the Google display network has banner advertising. You also have um, Google Shopping, for example, which is what's commonly known as a comparison shopping engine. Um, other, um, other types of comparison shopping engines you might be familiar with um, might be Amazon, for example. Um, <clears throat> so it's just, uh, just to give you that upper level perspective that um, when you are operating, these big brands are generally operating um, and doing media buys through these, the broader sphere of performance. Um, I wanted to kind of keep it really simple um, from a startup perspective. Um, I'm kind of conscious that the majority of people that I'll be talking to would not come from a marketing background or, um, or be uh, business owners. Um, so I, I wanted to simplify effectively what I look at and, and some of the core areas that you might look at to be able to build a really effective search campaign. Um, and I broadly define those as creative um, segmentation and targeting and landing page experience. Um, so creative is a bit of a um, advertising industry jargon. It's effectively the messaging, you know, whether it's video in some contexts or um, some kind of great ad. Um, in this context, it's gonna be a text ad. Um, you obviously want to have something that's enticing that's going to get somebody to click through. Segmentation and targeting. So um, segmentation, the primary form of segmentation within search is your actual keyword level, um, where the intent is quite explicit. Um, users are going to want to search um, for specific terms and you're going to want to identify those terms, target them um, and bid the right amount for them. So it's not just about um, being able to segment the right audiences on a keyword level, um, but you also want to make sure that you're returning, achieving a return of, an, of investment um, on a keyword level, ideally. Um, that's not to say that's the only type of segmentation that occurs within search. You also get um, your traditional marketing demos, um, age, uh, income levels, uh, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and finally, landing page experience. So commonly one that's a little bit overlooked, um, but at the end of the day, uh, a great search campaign um, will align the three of these concepts together and provide a great um, segmentation. So you've, you've nailed the right audience. Sorry. <clears throat> you've nailed the right audience. You've provided, provided a very enticing copy to get them to click through. Now they're gonna land on your landing page and evaluate your offer. So don't forget to be able to pull that lever as well in terms of um, optimizing your campaign, not only because you want those users to eventually convert, but because as I'll explain later, there's a whole bunch of um, metrics or relevancy scores attached to your landing pages. All right, so kind of getting further into these concepts, um, the creative. You want to engage, as mentioned, you want to engage customers with creative ad copy. Um, I have on the right um, one of my favourite um, pieces of ad copy, which is actually um, done on a, co on a competitor um, term, um, two project management suites, um, both excellent. Um, in terms of delivering your ad copy, you want to provide, um, you want to build an ad format that uh, best suits your needs. Um, when I say needs, at the end of the day, when you're building a search campaign, you can go extremely granular across all three levels of the, the different pillars that I mentioned earlier, um, but you're gonna to have to make decisions around how much time you're investing. So um, within the ad layer, you could be creating responsive search ads or RSA. Um, so you're basically opening up um, to Google how what the final mix of headlines and descriptions are gonna be here. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure whether you can actually see my cursor on this. Is this? Um, yep. Yeah, yeah, we can see your cursor. It's fine. 
Yeah, excellent. Okay. Um, so just effectively for people that, that aren't really familiar, you've got certain character limits around how you write ads. So you, you're generally looking at headline one, headline two, headline three, um, 30 characters each, um, uh, a description of 90 characters, but then potentially two descriptions within an extended text ad format. Um, and then what you're seeing below here is um, some extensions in this context. You're looking at some, uh, at some links. Um, minimum viable inventory to be able to serve, um, sorry, format to serve is two descriptions, uh, sorry, two headlines and one description. Um, however, you know, best practices obviously to be able is to use all the levers you can. Um, so you can write up to three headlines and two descriptions. Um, you want to be able to do that. And when people are traditionally right, doing these, putting these campaigns together, they look at it from a um, perspective of uh, screen real estate. Um, and your screen real estate isn't predefined by your characters, is actually predefined um, by the pixels that you can capture. And so that's why you see... Um, people using, and you might even see in this presentation as a force of habit, people using proper case when they're writing these. So they're capitalizing, um, they're capitalizing all the keywords within a certain headline or even in descriptions. Although I think that's a little bit more optional when you're writing these. Um, so that's a good example there within the, um, uh, within the extension there. Um, other kind of best practice that I would advise when you're writing your ad copy is to kind of understand um, that this is an option um, and you are going to have to represent your offer relatively to your competitors. So go out and have a look at, especially for your key audiences, go and have a look at your competitors ad copy um, that's going to be serving. Go in and actually make those searches and see, okay, well, how can I differentiate myself? Um, and then I think it, it often gets neglected, but um, especially relative to the targeting, a lot of us are gonna try and build a campaign um, that is really effectively segmented. And we might even come back later and iterate upon that segmentation, but not many of us are going to be applying the same level of um, granularity in how we approach our ad copy. Um, I think, people generally can experience some level of burnout in ad copy, although it's not the same as in social media where you're kind of blasting them with a higher frequency. So you generally want to rotate your ads within, you know, maybe a six to 12 month um, uh, rotation, um, even if um, it's relatively well performing. Um, but you definitely want to, in an ideal world, be running A-B tests within your um, ad copy on an ongoing basis because you want to be able to see what's resonating with customers um, and trying to improve your click-through rates in the long term. Um, targeting and segmentation. So um, I think people will generally be reasonably familiar if you have if you're in the ecosystem around your different match types. Um, just to say that um, the, here's a kind of a good example of, of how these, these keywords are generally segmented. Um, the idea is that um, you might want to either on the, on the most uh, tight end um, or most uh, focused end of, of keyword match types, exact match, um, you, you want to be very, very exact around what keywords are triggering. Um, all the way down to uh, more relaxed um, targeting um, within the broad match sphere, um, where you're getting what you consider semantic matches, um, interchangeable terms. Um, you you generally want to, you're looking at a casting a much wider net within that segmentation. Um, what you see within um, search execution um, generally is. Um, search professionals will mix and match the different types. Um, I know that one specific um, popular form of building campaigns that's popped up in the last couple of years is what's called SCAGs or single keyword ad groups. Um, the reason and, and effectively what that is, is people running exact and broad match modified um, targeting. Um, the reason behind that being is because 
you have the most level of control around exact. And in an ideal world, you're really just running an exact match campaign, but you're really sacrificing your reach in doing so. So you have to kind of be able to in, ten, cast a wider net within some context. That's where your broad match comes in. But then in an ideal world, you're not, uh, realistically, you're just not going to know um, all of the high intent audiences, even in the most well-researched campaigns. So you want to be able to look back and see some of those terms that might be triggering through broad match modifier that are doing really well and bring them into your exact match. Um, they're kind of what you would call alpha and beta campaigns where the alpha um, is your primary exact matches and your beta is your um, broad match modifiers. Um, and in the long term, you're bringing those broad matches into the exact match. Um, of course, as mentioned, um, you've got your segmentation and segment, good segmentation will get you some way. But um, at the end of the day, you want to know that you're achieving a return on investment. Um, I've had a lot of, number of conversations with clients where I effectively say the line, look, at the end of the day, I don't have an opinion around what's a high intent term or, or not, because you've got the variable around how competitive the auction is. Um, and any, any keyword has an opportunity to achieve return on investment. We're not going to know that until we've built the campaigns and we're running the data through it. Um, I don't want to discount a term, discount a term um, uh, that we see is potentially relevant um, based on an opinion. Um, I want to collect the data on that. Um, <clears throat> it might be it might be an un, uh, a cheap term that can achieve return on investment. Um, so here's. Um, in terms of actually achieving that return on investment on a keyword level, you've got a number of different um, a number of different uh, bidding strategies. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of, I won't go through each one of them. Um, suffice to say, um, they, there's different approaches. I think that that lend themselves to different stages of maturity that a campaign offer campaign. Um, initially, you're looking at um, more impression based um, strategies. Um, where you're just trying to grab visibility, kind of get an understanding of, of how users are interacting with Google search or how, what are the core commercial terms that are of interest to you. Um, you're not going to know that unless you achieve impressions or um, uh, are actually serving ads to those people. Um, later on, as you kind of better understand that, you're moving more to conversion-based strategies where you really want to understand what the cost per acquisition of these um, audiences are and put your resources towards more um, efficient and better return on investment terms. Um, and finally, that last pillar, um, I think, is also a term, um, a, an area that, uh, that's worth focusing on. Um, it can be a little bit inaccessible to some people because it might require you to have a web developer in or might require you to have some understanding of, um, of uh, user experience or how to use a page builder. Um, there are, of course, ways to get around that, um, as I'll kind of explain a little bit later. Um, specific landing page builder software gets used in these contexts. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you want to be able to pull some of the, the levers within your actual landing page experience, whether that's modifying your offer. Um, you know, we're looking at um, a Blue Apron, which is um, effectively America's version of um, these food delivery services um, here. So you can see they've got a discount offer that they might not potentially offer through their core user experience or core website experience. So a landing page is great for that because it's what you consider an orphan page. A user can't, can't navigate through the core um, user pathways there, but it gives you also segmenting that traffic. So you know they're coming through search, you know the keywords they're coming through, and you know that you can leverage that intent and potentially spend more money on the offer because you know that you'll get that return on investment on that traffic. Um, you're typically looking at much more streamlined user experiences in these landing pages. Um, and that's mainly because uh, of one of the later points here that um, if you were within your core 
user experience or your main website, you may, you bring in considerations like the content architecture of your site or SEO um, considerations. So there's gonna be certain things around content or you're gonna look at different user journey paths, whether it's a first entry point within your site, a second one, or what supporting pages are interacting with this. So the content potentially is gonna be spread out um, across that more diverse user journey. Um, here, you just want to get straight to the point. You know what the intent is very explicitly. You want to address that intent. You want to potentially pull levers on the offer um, and convert those customers, um, especially because you're paying for them. Um, there's also considerations within the actual um, ecosystem. Um, Google is looking at the content and the structured elements of these landing pages. And, um, and factoring them into uh, your quality scores or how it actually rates your campaigns. So it's important to be able to, in an, I mean, in an ideal world, you're looking at all your core audiences and you're building niche landing pages for these audiences. Um, so um, I think a, a good, it could be building a landing page for my morning startup, for example. Um, and then building a, a, landing, a specific landing page for just my presentation on morning startup, for example, um, to kind of explain that granularity. Um, obviously you wanna, um, given all of that flexibility, you wanna have the eye catching headlines, really strong trust elements, um, such as um, certifications, testimonials, um, any kind of user feedback, um, to make people really remove that friction around your offer. <clears throat> um, uh, before I kind of get into ad rank, which is really at the core of um, search, I just want um, to give, provide a very quick uh, overview and, and just talk about it from Google's perspective. Um, at the end of the day, I think it's important to understand um, search as a product as well um, that Google's developing. I know that can be a little bit of a um, strange concept to think about it, given that Google is such a large company and it's, um, it's just so ubiquitous with the way that we live. Um, but at the end of the day, as a product, search want, uh, Google wants to provide a really great search experience. Um, it need, people need to, when users interact with it, they need to find the information that they want. Um, really quickly, um, and ideally, it's, it, it, it addresses the question really holistically and provides value to them. So, within the context of search, um, you're getting pe having people insert into that auction, um, in, into those indexes with potentially ads that might not be relevant um, or information that might not be relevant. Um, so just remember that Google has its own motivations around search. Um, Google attributes about 90% of its actual revenue from search, which I know kind of was a bit, took me a bit back when I first saw it, um, given that, um, given that uh, uh, it was such a massive company. Um, but it is the primary way under which Google monetizes its product. Um, and so as a consequence of that, Google has a number of mechanisms under which it makes sure that search doesn't compromise its core product. Um, and, all, and, and if you want to be a little bit more cynical, a number of ways to make sure it's maximizing its profit from the way that it's monetizing. Um, so I'll kind of explain that a little bit further now. Um, core to that is applying an ad rank to your ads. Um, so I've <clears throat> poached a really great diagram that I've come across um, within the context of my experience um, to kind of explain that. Um, at the end of the day, you are in a competitive auction. Um, Google's going to take a number of different factors uh, to, that it uses to understand the relevancy of your ads um, and then multiply it by how much you're willing to bid. Um, so the ad rank is really that that hidden figure that is that is controlling the quality and the relevance of the searches to make sure that you're not advertising for pools on searches about bikes. Um, 
uh, and then incrementally, you only need to be bidding one increment more um, than your the second advertiser. That's effectively what this diagram is showing. Um, so behind your ad rank is a quality scores, score um, calculation. Um, it's important to note the quality score isn't an actual KPI for your campaign. Um, no one should be looking at their quality score and say, um, if I improve my quality scores, then I'm going to be improving my return on investment necessarily. Um, and um, conversely, you don't want to be too obsessed with your quality scores um, in terms of um, how you're optimised. Just treat it as a diagnostic tool um, to be able to better understand how Google is reading um, different elements of your search campaign um, and, and obviously improve them over time. But it's not actually a metric that's used. It's a kind of like a hidden, it, it, it's a summary kind of metric or um, top line to how your campaign is working. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so kind of now that I've kind of just described those three pillars and, and given you the overview, just want to give some some feedback into how you can actually enhance your search beyond the you know your base campaign. Um, I think one really core thing that you, the the big difference in terms of how experts build their campaigns um, or further expand their campaigns is you see more robust attribution frameworks um, applied within search on a professional level. Um, this is probably a topic that deserves its own um, talk. Um, so I won't delve too deep into it. Um, suffice to say that your attribution network, your attribution framework is important for more than just search. It's important to attribute all of your channels and all of your marketing and kind of look at it from what's called an omni-channel perspective. So how are those channels playing together within the customer journey? Um, but I think it's what's important to note about within the context of our conversation is um, until you have that attribution framework and that data pulling through, you're not gonna be able to actually really understand how your keywords are converting. And as a consequence of that, you're not gonna be able to make decisions around um, CPA bidding um, or different ways of segmenting your campaigns. So it's a really key to being able to optimize really efficiently. Um, at the end of the day, um, all that data should be pulled through to some kind of dashboarding and visualized and to what um, people in the data world would consider a, a tell a data story behind it, um, because that's the only way you can be able to actually pull insights out of it, or especially if you're trying to communicate performance to a client or um, to some kind of key stakeholder that's not in the weeds of your search campaign. Um, yeah, uh, so another kind of key area that you just don't see done within um, your more um, amateur level campaigns is you don't see remarketing. Um, I kind of consider remarketing as like on a top level from, from a search perspective as just improving your conversion rates on your core campaigns. Um, you're creating another touch point um, for your search campaigns. So the most standard application of this is to be able to set up your attribution framework, um, create audiences for all users that um, engage with your website or all users that are coming through search, and then setting up a, um, a GDN campaign or building these banners. So on the right, you're seeing what is effectively one creative ad set execution within the different dimensions of a Google display campaign um, through the GDN network. Um, the goal of that is, well, you can see that the messaging might be significantly different um, to, uh, to what the initial search ad was. Um, you, you can see in the top right, for example, there's a uh, ebook opportunity. So you, you're presenting even more content um, one of the most creative ways I've seen display um, implemented is actually in post-customer care. Um, so segmenting audiences that actually 
um, have already converted and then putting a thank you message out through display um, or asking to be able to take feedback. And I thought that was quite innovative actually. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and then, oh. Just while you get back on track, I noticed um, something about, you know, Apple's introducing these new features in iOS to stop uh, people being tracked all over the place by people like Facebook, and that's greatly going to affect their advertising model of, of targeting demographics through Facebook. But uh, it appears that, you know, Google search is still Google search. You know, that it's not going to be affected by things like that. If people are searching for your product on Google, you can still display the correct ad to those people. So, uh, yeah, it's sort of becoming still relevant or even more so relevant if you can't target people effectively through um, Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I know that it, that's really breaking news. So... Yeah. Um, I haven't really fully digested that one, um, but I know there were a number of memes around performance marketers reacting to that um, and having heart <laughs> attacks. Um, it really affects um, paid performance media or any kind of brand awareness um, channels um, being able to attribute effectively, which was already really hard. Yeah, um, sure. uh, so I think those channels will move more to just pure awareness metrics um, uh, a final kind of uh, tips around being able to enhance your search um, campaign is run conversion optimization tests. So this kind of speaks to landing page um, theory. You want to be able to make sure that you can build the absolute most perceived value behind your offering. Um, and that's going to sit mainly within that landing page. Um, there's obviously opportunities to be able to re-engage and expand the communications that you have um, through remarketing and potentially, you know, we saw an example of someone following up with an ebook um, that could have been a second step beyond um, an initial um, conversion based landing page. Um, but effectively, what it is um, so, what you're seeing here is some graphics around um, Google's e ecosystem around doing that. So um, Google has their Google attribution, which was in beta for a number of years, but um, I believe some people have access to it now. Um, I think it works, plays really nicely with um, Google Analytics. Um, double click if anyone's in the programmatic realm. Um, Google, uh, Google Tag Manager. Um, it's just they're basically creating this suite that's going to compete with Adobe and the like um, to be able to for you to be able to do everything you need right through to the dashboarding um, through uh, Google Studio. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, I, I kind of one thing that I mentioned earlier um, in terms of if you don't have that in engineering skill, um, software or web web designers in, in um, web developers in-house, you can always look at a um, off-the-shelf solution for um, doing this um, through a page builder such as lead pages or unbounce they're kind of two of the market leaders in that area I know there's big um, big agencies that still are using those because they want to empower their search managers to to be op optimizing this and not have the delay around talking building that broader team and talking to engineering they want people to be able to use these GUI um, um, page builders um, and, and run these tests themselves without the delay. Um, or beyond this, you're also looking at potentially more, more standardised CRO techniques such as heat mapping with something like a crazy egg or a hot jar just to really understand how users are interacting with those pages and how you can optimise. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm going to get... We're getting to kind of the stage of the um, presentation where I'm going to really kind of focus in on that core question, um, the title of the um, presentation being how can startups build acquisition? Um, I think one key tip is to, when you're building these campaigns, look at your forecasts around them. 
Um, so I think part of this is a, an element that's within the Google Keyword Planner tool. Um, I think that's a really strong ecosystem to learn. And uh, if you want to be able to build a strong search campaign, I'm um, just in, in terms of setting up your targeting. But then on the back of that, you'll, you'll see these forecasts. Um, it's, it's what you see in these forecasts is a really strong representation of um, some of those initial key objectives. I know I mentioned earlier the idea of being able to go out and grab initial visibility with a campaign. Well, what you're seeing here is a forecast and some data behind that before you've actually launched. So you're seeing um, specific conversions um, on the on the y-axis. You're seeing how those impressions um, are exponentially deliver how, how there's an exponential curve. And I think a key insight here is it's an auction, right? Just the way that Google search is structured. Um, Google structures their product on a level that everyone can play. If you're looking down here at this option uh, of the, the impression graph, you're looking at the cheapest clicks um, that can be achieved. Now, these might be in, um, in less favorable times, but typically I think there's a, a key insight here for startups is that there's always somewhere you can play in search you know if you're coming in and you want to be able to grab maximum visibility or you're a market leader then you're you're happy to take the reduced cost per acquisition um, or that you would get at this level when you see it kind of flattening out here these are the expensive clicks this is if you're looking at a campaign that's you know in your 80 to 90 approaching 100 percent impression share so you're basically serving an ad for every single keyword search that you're targeting. Whereas down here, you're looking at, you know, 20, 30%. Um, Google's giving you that opportunity to play there um, and, and achieve a return on investment. So don't treat it as one ubiquitous um, market that is too expensive. Um, there's different strategies that can be applied um, across search and, and different levels of campaigns. Um, I think within a broader growth strategy, you're just looking at uh, what I kind of advise to startups or, or small mediums is really any, any business with a great product can grow with just one distribution channel that's working for them. That could be Google search for you. That could be that initial acquisition channel that's working for you. Um, I wouldn't get too caught up with the fact that you're not building out a broad customer journey across social, um, SEO, um, or content. Just get one channel working for you initially, um, whether that's a high impact channel or an instant impact channel such as search or more long-term um, strategies such as SEO or content marketing. Um, and then here's kind of, we're going really deep, but this is what, um, your more advanced companies are doing and I'd really advise um, uh, startups to be looking at if they're willing to put the work in in their attribution. Um, there's very few companies I talk to that really understand the lifetime value of their customers, um, you know, or concepts line around annualized lifetime value. Um, but these are key to really understand um, how, what levels of ROI or what um, that you can play in. Um, so when you go down to um, uh, your cost to acquire customers, um, as you see the quote down the bottom, um, a really benchmark is a one to three or a 33% um, uh, CAC. So, but I've kind of seen guidance of a three to four. Um, when you're kind of approaching a ratio of, one to four with your marketing spend um, to your broad cost cost base. It's um, your your kind of that's generally what you see from a really profitable company. Um, I guess what you some of the key insight for startups is well, how well funded are you um, from day one? Are you willing to take a, a closer to a one or two um, cap early on just to acquire customers? Um, and then build your virility of those customers because you know you have a great product that they're going to refer. Um, obviously, if you have a great product, then um, the cost of actually advertising to um, customers is going to be cheaper because more of them are going to convert, um, more of them are going to refer. So just have that in mind. 
Um, so that's kind of the end of the overview. Um, I just love getting some of our illustrations in. Um, so I just wanted to kind of shine a light on some of the key questions that I typically get um, from like entry level to some of the more advanced. Um, what's the future of Google Ads? Um, I think what we've seen recently is we used to have a static inventory within Google Ads. So we used to have um, a, a setup where four ads would show at the top, three ads would show at the bottom. Um, and so the way that we actually structured campaigns was quite different to what, how we structure today. These days, um, inventory is actually dynamic. So sometimes if the bids or the, um, the what we'd see in the past is we, we would typically, we had strategies that were looking for third or fourth position. Um, so just above the fold, um, but people just weren't, um, and, and that was a really, really effective strategy because you're paying um, quite cheap rates for good visibility. Now, what you're seeing is sometimes Google won't even serve an option if the bids aren't high enough. Um, you don't know whether it's going to be potentially one serving at the top, um, whether you'll serve at the bottom. Um, so strategies have changed a little bit. Um, I actually see one of the most interesting things about search actually happening at the moment is isn't through actual Google ads, interestingly enough, it's happening through YouTube. So um, this was in beta for a long time. And I know this because I was um, working for a couple of Google premier partner agencies, and that's where you get access to some of these better beta information and advanced information from Google around what they're testing. Um, but um, in YouTube, they were, they're now kind of connecting the searches around on a keyword level, um, and you're getting that opportunity to cross advertise um, that you just never had before. It was more just straight demographic um, segmentation before. So I think that's really exciting. Um, remember that YouTube is actually also a search engine as well. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on. <clears throat> um, how do search and SEO work together? Um, so I know Scott, uh, was asking me some, a question along this line um, when I caught up with him initially. Um, first and foremost, um, search will not allow you to rank better um, in SEO. I'm just going to dispel that myth straight away. Um, search has um, key markers or mechanisms within it that are very similar to the way that SEO works because at the end of the day, as I was explaining earlier, they want someone to land on a relevant landing page that is aligned with the offer that's presented in Google search. Um, but it's not going to um, help you rank better in any way. Whenever I'm approaching this from a growth perspective, I say, um, I talk about what a really traditional concept and that's um, the idea of um, share of voice. So if you're trying to segment a specific audience or a specific keyword, um, and you can, and it's a return, there's a return on investment in doing so in investing in SEO and investing in search. Well, then why wouldn't you have an ad at the top building that visibility and potentially getting that first click through? And why wouldn't you um, concurrently also be building your SEO in, into first position, ideally? Um, when you look at the end of the day, a successful, if both those strategies are working successfully, well, then you've got a large amount of screen space that um, presents your offering. <clears throat> um, obviously, as well, you could be have local SEO visibility as well through um, Google Maps. Um, I'm just going to bring this one up because it's a funny one every time it gets brought up to me. Um, and for someone that's worked in the industry for a long time, um, it always comes up. Less so these days. Um, is Google AdWords a scam? You definitely get comments from people saying, you know, I've just wasted a lot of money on there. Um, so I can't really speak to it more around than just the, the guidelines. There's a lot of companies that Google search and clients of ours, for example, that have built their business off Google search and they have nothing else because they're still scaling their product to keep up with the leads. Um, but this could be the same, just make that channel work for you effectively. Um, of course, if you get it wrong, then you can waste a lot of money you're paying per click. Um, but it's important that if you apply the right due diligence that um, everything can work for you. 
Um, obviously, there's going to be, if your product is in an emerging segment, um, you're going to have the advantage that those options aren't going to be extremely competitive. So you'll pay a low cost per click. But remember also that the actual amount of audience that's searching for that is going to be lower. So it's hard to say whether um, it's really more effective um, for startups or big businesses. Um, you really see that with the data, but definitely Google Ads when run correctly and, and applied the right due diligence can work for anybody. Um, kind of tailing on from, is it a scam? Um, do you see a lot of level of credit fraud, fraud? I know a lot of people before they look to invest in that channel, they're worried that, well, aren't my competitors just gonna be clicking on um, my ads? Um, historically, so it's, there's a bit of nuance to that, this answer. Um, there is click forward 100% within um, Google search. Um, it really depends on how you define it. So like on the really most base level, you could have a customer that has an intent to, that's a genuine customer and has intent to purchase your services um, or at least to give your offer a go that might click on a search, get disconnected from their session, come back and click it again. And that would be considered click click fraud because they've clicked twice on your offering within the space of a few minutes or seconds, right? Um, traditionally, we're, what I've kind of seen is click fraud is around, it's north of, um, it's about 95% plus are legitimate clicks on search. Um, you just have to approach that three, 2% or, or around that mark that you might expect as a sunk cost of the channel at the end of the day. And that's what happens. Google, Google has really, really strong um, uh, mechanisms around um, detecting click fraud. I've had scenarios and I won't mention the context because it, it might implicate people, but um, where we've put up a campaign and achieved 95% invalid clicks on the first day. Um, and Google detected those. So um, especially once that campaign was running for a number of months, we saw um, very much normalized um, click fraud um, levels. Um, but it's also important to note that on that first day, none of those clicks were actually costed. They didn't cost us anything as so they were detected. Um, how do I rank my ads number one? Um, do you, I think a key uh, response to that question is, do you really want to rad, um, rank your ads number one? Um, I think you should approach it from a return on investment perspective and, and understand what maturity is your business at, um, what's your, what kind of growth are you looking for? Um, I think generally you just want to achieve a good amount of visibility and return on investment on your search rather than trying to pay the most you can for the most visibility. Um, how long does it take to achieve a return through Google search? Um, with, if you're structuring your campaigns correctly, um, you know, I kind of, when, when somebody comes to me for search, for example, I'll say, look, I've got the experience. That's my bread and butter. Um, my goal is to achieve it from day one. Um, but that's not to say that all campaigns can achieve return on investment from day one. Um, and you definitely need to look at it from a data perspective, the more data you have, the more you can optimize a campaign. So a campaign should age over time and get better um, as you begin to optimize it. Um, but obviously you're gonna have, the, there's a number of variables in Google search. It is a competitive option. You're just not gonna know from day one necessarily if it's gonna be achieving the return on investment that you want. And you might need to optimize for that. Um, so that kind of comes to the end of um, the talk. Uh, I, I wanted to open it up for questions from the audience um, at this point, um, but also just note um, if you enjoyed the uh, conversation and you want to follow up, feel free to shoot me a message through LinkedIn. Um, follow us on the channels in your bottom left. Brilliant. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Thank Round of applause. So we did, uh, did put a... Put your questions in the chat box. Um, All right. So we've had a Looks like there are a few that have come through. Um, so let's start with uh, Farzan. So do, uh, does your standard G Suite account have access to Google Ads, Google Tag Manager, Attribution, et cetera? 
I think it does, right? Yeah, it does. Um, one, uh, I think one caveat to this is that Google has like a, um, through Google search, um, there are what's called smart campaigns. Um, we actually have a blog article coming out about that in the next couple of weeks. Keep a look on our blog if, if you want to read about that. Um, but that's basically um, Google's streamlined kind of beginner level um, version of Google search um, that allows people kind of like simplifies a lot of it um, and, and makes it much easier to build your own campaigns, um, obviously with um, less opportunities to optimise it, but it's a good starting point. Cool. All right. Okay. There's the, the question here from Jack. Uh, do you think Google will ever combine their search engines, e.g. blend YouTube, Google into a standard experience similar to searching on a Nest Hub? Um, well, they're kind of doing that in the beta. I think what, what I was talking about earlier um, was what's exciting is that um, you never were able to target YouTube traffic through a keyword level. And the keyword level um, is great because, um, and that's what really makes search and SEO so powerful because when you actually look at um, a query or you're targeting a query, you can make a reasonable assumption on what the intent is behind that and say, oh, okay, well, that customer is really valuable to my, um, to my business and I'm going to um, try and be visible to them. So you could potentially see the same thing happening within YouTube um, in the coming years. Um, around certain videos so you know um, there's the I'm sure and that's just a sphere people probably haven't been thinking about um, you know potential people doing DIY videos um, on on YouTube and being able to retarget them with some banner ads um, it, it really opens up um, that it, it's really it's re, it's super interesting um, not people not many people might know this but the actual ecosystems within Google um, around the different advertising, um, whether it's um, their voice, uh, the video units within YouTube or search, those teams are working really independently. And I know that's a little bit crazy to think, um, but it's taken them years to actually um, look at combining those ecosystems. They were all kind of all working on their own products independently. And now they're only really starting to approach trying to unify those ecosystems. Right, interesting. Uh, there, there's a super interesting question here from Mary from uh, Noisy Guts. Um, are there any broader gender biases with regards to customer segment responses to ads, YouTube, SEO? Because it seems like YouTube is used more by men, but do young women use it more? So I don't know if you've got any thoughts on gender biases with regards to uh, campaigns. Um. Yeah, gender biases on campaigns. Um, I think I think it's really an audience specific um, response. There, um, you're going to be able to see that data within your YouTube dashboard around who's interacting with your um, channels, or you're going to be able to see in your demographics report on Google Analytics around who is interacting with your search and landing on your website. Um, so I would always say, you know, don't necessarily, you, whilst absolutely, I, and I've made the recommendation earlier, you know, do forecasting and have a look at these demos within the planner. Um, but you, you can see that data on any, on any search. Um, I think what's really interesting, and I thought if I can segue this a little bit, um, uh, is there any kind of biases actually prohibited within the frameworks? Um, you know, um, can you actually, does Google prohibit people from segmenting low income, um, people from low incomes from search, for example? And you do actually, what's interestingly seen is um, Google does prohibit certain searches um, from a safety perspective um, and um, certain kind of applying certain gender biases and advertising, which I think is really interesting. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it depends who you're targeting as well. If you're targeting, you know, teenage girls, then probably Instagram is a good channel. There's probably a gender bias there, but obviously mm -hmm. guys use that as well in certain segments. Um, you, can be, but then you, you obviously have to apply, well, what's your product as well through those right. channels as well. So it can be, it'd be a difficult question to broad base answer. Um, yeah. 
you might have a product that, you know, 80% of the users are men, you know, um, right. and then obviously every channel that you advertise, you're going to be focusing in on men, whether, you know, whether that channel on a broad base level has a 55 female to 45 male split or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Just to relate that, you know, my, my company, we're in enterprise software space targeting to IT administrators, which just inherently, unfortunately, is still male dominated. Um, LinkedIn is a great channel for us, um, which is used by men and women, probably 50-50. I don't know what the split is there, but uh, certainly for our customer segment, it is, is male dominated. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah. Definitely. So um, just time, if you have any more questions, put it in the chat box. Um, but um, so just a quick question from myself, Tom, to you. We see now advertising, you did touch on it a bit around the, the fraudulent clicks. Um, are they selling um, a valid service or would you would not invest in something similar to that where they're essentially safeguarding you or identifying those clicks? And how is that any different from the stuff that Google is offering? Um, sorry, sorry, can you refine a bit? Dave? Yeah, so I get, I get these advertisements when on YouTube, they're like, save your clicks. If you're, you know, X oh, amount right. of number of clicks, as you mentioned, uh, and there seems to be a number of uh, this new dawn of companies that have all spun up who essentially pay them a subscription and they're able to identify. <coughs> How is that any different to what Google's doing? And should we just ignore them or should we actually take them seriously? Um, okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So these third party crypt click fraud protection suites. Um, the industry broadly is kind of undecided around them, just to be honest. Um, the idea is that they have that extra layer of, add that extra layer of protection um, <clears throat> for your campaigns above um, Google's um, native algorithms that they're, they're looking at this. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, you're saving yourself potentially 5%, somewhere in that range like as quite a broad comment um but that's 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 why there's two different camps that even if they are effective then um you know how much room do they have to be efficient but, um that being said um i think within native there they do provide an actual function that's actually very fundamental to how search campaigns are run um, but very, very, very few people actually do that, and that's IP blocking. So you actually have a function within Google search to IP block people. Um, but as you can imagine, nobody's <laughs> searching their server logs on an ongoing basis and reviewing those IPs and going, okay, well, this guy's come through, but I can kind of see that that's a fraudulent click that Google didn't pick up, and I'm going to make sure that he's IP blocked for the next one. Um, so they automate that process. Um, uh, they also claim to have some, some basically a different approach to how their IP blocking that's different um, to how Google does it. So I think it really, you, you just have to test it. First of all, you have to be doing a decent amount of spend for them to be worthwhile. Um, but then you really just got to look at it um, your experiences with it. So some people are going to advocate it. Um, others, especially those running smaller campaigns, um, are going to say it was, wasn't worth the cost. Right. Yeah, I know there's definitely some dirty tricks. I know one of our competitors, when we moved offices, they basically, as soon as you did a, a, a search for it, their local office came up when you searched our name for it. And we were like, you cheeky buggers. Yeah. <laughs> Fix that problem. But um, yeah. yeah, it's definitely slightly dirty out there. Tom, it's been great. Thank you very much. We're 13 minutes to nine. Um, is there anything else, Scott, we've got to do just before we, we close out? Uh, I guess we can announce the next speaker in two weeks' time. Um, it's on cybersecurity, Dave, if you were organising that one. Yes, I will wait for that to be confirmed. But, um, yeah, in a couple of weeks, hopefully we'll have Glenn. Glenn, if you're watching this, I will be chasing you. If not, we'll be, we'll be putting it up on Meetup and uh, when people, and the next one will be in person. So, um, yeah, Tom, thank you well, very much. Up. You've got your details of how people can get in contact with you there on the screen. Um, if you have any questions for Tom, use that. Use the LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or Twitter to get in contact with him. Tom, it's been great. Thank you very much for sharing your insights. Very, very valuable. My pleasure. Thanks, Dave. Let's go.
Next yeah, thank you very much, Tom. See you in person in two weeks. Thanks, everyone, for attending. <laughs> yeah, hopefully yeah. see you in person. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Cheers. Bye. See you guys. Bye. <clears throat>